Um, welcome back to Apex at Home. Uh, we're going into the seventh hour uh, of today's home run. And uh, my name is Menno uh, from the Apex development team. I'm the moderator for this session. Um, and first of all, if you have questions, then uh, put them in the Q&A. And after the talk, you can submit your feedback uh, for the presenter and you have a chance to win this beautiful sweater and a key uh, uh, back tag. So next up will be Stefan Dobre. He's based in Vienna, uh, in Austria. And as he says himself, he's a full-time Apex enthusiast and he works for Foex and has a huge amount of knowledge about the plugin architecture and plugins in general. And he's a proud contributor to the Apex open source community. So with that, uh, hi Stefan, nice that you joined us today. Hello. And uh, yeah, take it away, the stage is all yours. Just quickly have to get the Zoom thing right and I'll be right with you. Yes. Do you see my desktop? I see your desktop, yes. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks. Uh, before we begin to uh, all the developers and all the um, presenters and all the organizers for this awesome uh, community effort, it really means a lot to both uh, get good content uh, during this period and also to have some uh, human connection, even if virtual. So awesome effort. Thanks for that. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Stefan Dobre and I work for Foix, um, where I do all types of things around Apex plugins and uh, uh, tools for and around Oracle Apex. That's also my hobby nowadays anything Apex and especially Apex, Apex plugins, so I thought I would give uh, a little talk around it. You can reach out to me over at um, Stefan underscore underscore Dobra on Twitter um, in case you have any questions or just want to reach out. So this will be the agenda for the day. I will try to get through the theory as quick as possible uh, because I have a big announcement uh, concerning a new tool for Apex development that I'm extremely excited for to share with you guys today. Uh, and right after that, I will give a quick live demo of building a plugin from zero to 100% um, in about 20 minutes. So uh, let's see how that goes. Um, yeah, in terms of the theory, I will quickly discuss the different types of plugins that there are um, and when you would want to use what the benefits and drawbacks generally when talking about plugins, um, where to find them, just in case you don't wanna build it yourself, just wanna use something that's already out there, and the more um, technical side of things, the actual anatomy of a plugin. So what are the different types of plugins? If you think a text field or a select list or a date picker, these are all item type plugins. These are things that hold a value in session state. So if you want, to build a plugin that has a value that you submit over to the backend, it would most likely be an item type plugin. In terms of dynamic actions, these are things that do something on the, on the page dynamically triggered by a certain event. Um, and they're usually mostly JavaScript based. So even simple things like hide or show, which might even be only one line of JavaScript that is considered a dynamic action. Or you can have more complex things like a refresh, which actually has to talk to the uh, backend to fetch new data and uh, replace it on the page. Um, so you can have server communication in a dynamic action as well, but usually mostly JavaScript things. Um, a region, this would be a, think of it as a big visual component on the page, right? We, whether it's some lots of HTML with, uh, CSS or something static or a classic report, maybe something that refreshes or a really big component like an interactive grid. These are all region type components. So if we want to pack already existing functionality into a plugin um, or start from scratch, uh, usually such a 
um, such a component would be a region. If it's something usually visual, um, perhaps can be interacted with via dynamic actions, but does not necessarily hold a value. Um, processes are pretty common, but not as plugins from what I can tell. Uh, for example, the most commonly used uh, processes execute PL SQL code after you submit your page right in the processes tab you execute some code that would be a process plugin or the same email process it can also be considered an email plugin keep in mind these processes uh, don't only run on um, in the processes tab of your page so after submit you can also invoke them before headers or after footer or um, in those places as well uh, authorization plugins and authentication all also exist. They're just not that common. You will most likely see dynamic action plugins, item plugins, and region plugins, from what I can tell, and also from looking at uh, Apex.world. So these are the different types. Let's quickly discuss the benefits and drawbacks. Why should we even care for plugins in the first place, besides um, you know bringing in new functionality, right? So. Think about it this way. You have this component that you built. I don't know what it does, but it's complicated, right? It's got HTML. It's got CSS. You hooked up a lot of um, dynamic actions into it. Um, it's, um, it's a big thing. And perhaps it works, and you, you got it working on one page. But what if you have to replicate the same uh, functionality on a second page or on a third, right? So in terms of reusability, if you pack your logic inside of a plugin, you can very easily create instances of that plugin all over the place, as opposed to having to um, perhaps even um, duplicate code and so on. So in terms of reusability, if you have such a complicated component, consider packing it in a plugin. Maintenance, the same thing. If you either want to fix a bug or uh, introduce new functionality, you shouldn't have to go through all of the instances and, and uh, fix them individually or enhance them individually. Just fix the actual plugin itself, and the change will then propagate um, to all of the instances. Other benefits of using plugins, and perhaps this is uh, not that great, but for me personally, I find that it is very difficult to sometimes debug Apex pages or to really understand what a developer was trying to make. So say you have this component again, and it's got so many dynamic actions that God knows how they're hooked up. Um, it could be quite uh, difficult for another developer to understand. Whereas had that component been just packed inside of a plugin, we would uh, see it very easily in the builder, see its settings, and uh, yeah, that would save lots of everyone's time. Um, the same thing can be easily exported and imported into another app, as opposed to having to you know take this HTML, take this CSS, hook in those dynamic actions, right? These are all benefits drawbacks of building a plugin. Um, I guess the build process is not trivial and it isn't as fast as it perhaps could be. Uh, there is a certain learning curve. It's not insurmountable, but it exists. That's to keep in mind. You will have to invest some time in, into learning how plugins work. And um, at the end, it's, it will be totally worth it, but there is that time to invest. Um, also, this is a uh, perhaps a criticism of plugins in general. They tend not to age very well. So as an example, I could think of uh, the Select2 plugin that was wildly popular. Um, and now it just, even visually, it doesn't seem to fit in with the rest of Apex. So plugins which are not necessarily maintained over the years, they don't really age well. Um, but yeah, that's not really a drawback to plugins uh, in general. That's just specific. But in my opinion, benefits clearly outweigh the drawbacks in developing, maintaining, and using plugins. OK, what if, so I want some new functionality. I don't want to reinvent the wheel. Where will I go to find perhaps something that my application needs? And that's where plugins are sort of separated into two different sections. We have the commercial side of things, and we have the free side of things that we all uh, love very much. Um, Commercially, from what I can tell, maybe I'm, I'm wrong, but I don't know of as many of uh, more players that are in this uh, um, commercial plugins game than the ones that are listed here. So we at Foex, we provide uh, a entire, an entire framework of plugins, which all work well together, so not, they're not uh, 
traditional types of plugins. But for example, the file upload image editor that we released recently is a commercial type of plugin. So the developer does have to pay a yearly fee to use it. Um, the folks at Apex R&D um, are also the people behind um, Apex Office Print and Apex Media Extension. Um, and these two things are more of services, but they do use a plugin um, to communicate with those services. Also, the Apex Smart Pivot, I've never used it myself, but uh, it is a commercial plugin in case um, you need some more Excel-like functionality inside of Apex, uh, if perhaps the interactive grid doesn't, uh, doesn't do it for you. Yeah, it's, there's not many commercial plugins out there, really. Uh, the space is slowly growing. Um, but yeah, it's not that big quite yet. On the free side of things, it's looking better. There are a lot of open source plugins. And if you haven't checked out apex.world yet, or if you don't know about it, I encourage you to go check it out. So a quick word about apex.world. It tries to be a hub for everything and anything Oracle Apex. Um, so you have a Slack channel, um, news and uh, Twitter feed. But the one I'm interested in is this plugins section. So most plugins out there, from what I can tell, are already indexed by apex.world. Uh, there's currently 226 plugins. So uh, that's not nothing. That's quite a, uh, a large number. So before you start implementing your own thing, I always suggest uh, to, to look up uh, this page to see if that plugin perhaps already exists. We do have to stay a bit realistic though with the Apex, with the open source stuff. Um, we are not guaranteed a bunch of things. So support is only there if the maintainer or the developer is nice enough to fix our, uh, our bugs. The quality tends to differ. So there's plugins out there that are amazing. So I always like to give the example of Daniel's um, Drop Zone 2 plugin, both the functionality itself and the even the, the quality of the code behind it is just amazing. Others are not so great. So we must always be careful what we use. Security is never guaranteed. So none of these plugins, uh, as far as I can tell, underwent a, an actual security review. So always before using a, uh, a uh, plugin, especially on production, make sure you looked over the code at least once and you know what it does. Um, updates, again, they're not... Uh, guaranteed, unfortunately. And yes, so there are about 200 plugins out there. Um, realistically speaking, only maybe upwards, a bit upwards of 100 still work um, and work well. And of those 100, I would say 50 are really good. I do not think all 200 are uh, production ready, so to say. But at least 50 are, uh, are very good and worth taking a look at. Okay, so the anatomy of a plugin. I, I just thought we can look at how a plugin is actually built and see um, what are the different uh, attributes that a plugin has inside of it. So I have a little plugin here, which we'll also be building later, hopefully, if we have time. So two things up top, we have the plugin name. This will be what you will end up seeing in your page designer. So make sure you pick a good name from the get-go. Um, for example, they will appear in this list if it's a page item. Um, I also like to not prefix my plugins with Apex something. We already know it's an Apex uh, plugin, so there's no need to, to prefix it with Apex, but that's just a personal preference. The internal name, make sure you choose a good one and that is unique, not only for yourself and for your company or for your app, but just in case it ever ends up going uh, uh, live into more instances, that it's unique on those instances as well, right? So a, a good uh, rule of thumb is to either add your name in there or your organization or company. Yeah, and the region type plugin. Keep in mind, once the plugin is already in use, so this one is used on one page, you will not be able to change the internal name or the plugin type. So while you wouldn't change the plugin type necessarily a lot, um, the internal name 
um, yeah, it kind of feels bad when you have to change it. So just make sure you pick a good one to start with and um, you'll be happy that you did that after. Um, this is the actual PL SQL code. We'll get to this part. You will need to perhaps print something out uh, to the HTTP buffer, right? Print some um, HTML on the page. This is the code that would do that. So for example, there, there are some callbacks. Some of them must be provided. So every plugin needs a, um, or almost all of them, need a render function. So you must specify the name that you gave your render function up here. If that changes, it's completely arbitrary. You can set it to whatever you want, but make sure it reflects this setting as well. And we're going to get into what the code actually does in a second. Um, supported for, this doesn't, this is pretty outdated as uh, the desktop user interface is the only user interface nowadays. So either select both or just desktop and that will be fine. Standard attributes, these are attributes that are common in many plugins. So the Apex team already built some, uh, uh, build them into the plugins for us just to tick some boxes. So for example, say um, no data message found. Um, say for example, you are building some report type of plugin and uh, when there's no more data to show, um, you want the developer to be able to set their own message. So instead of offering a setting for it, just tick this box, they will get an in-page designer, a field for it, which you can then grab um, and use in your code whenever you have to, to do that. So there's a lot of things here. Um, there's some help text. Uh, not all of it is present from what I've seen. So you, you might have to do some Googling, but these are very good attributes that most plugins uh, implement at least one of them. Then we get to custom attributes. So custom attributes is actually the attributes of, or the settings of your plugin. Because you don't want the plugin to behave the same everywhere, right? You want on each page, perhaps it's configured a little differently. That's how you let the developer tweak it on an instance basis. So you provide this plugin, these um, attributes, and they will appear, for example, for regions, they appear right under the region, as this is also a plugin, a static uh, region is a plugin. Um, the settings for it appear under attributes. The settings for a page item would appear under this settings field. Um, but just note, they're the same thing. They are custom attributes, and they were created like this in the plugin. Concerning files, um, if you build something a bit more visual or more interactive, perhaps you have JavaScript or CSS in there, it is always good not to hard code your, uh, your um, JavaScript directly into the PL SQL and generate it that way. It's always good to have it in a file, and the same goes for CSS. Um, you can upload files via this, up this upload uh, file button right there. But just because you uploaded the files doesn't mean that your plugin uses them automatically. You have to keep in mind that they must be referenced somewhere. So having referenced this file like this will ensure that this file will get loaded onto the page whenever the plugin is present. Um, you don't have to hard code them in here. There's also a JavaScript API. Perhaps on, sometimes you want to load this file or this other file. There is a PL SQL API to do it dynamically. But in 99% of cases, most plugins just have one JavaScript file. It's uploaded here and referenced here. Um, some other interesting things to keep uh, a version number. This is not enforced uh, anywhere. It's just for visual purposes, but it's always good to version your plugin. About URL, always a good idea to, to put something in there if you plan on distributing your plugin. Help text. I have a feeling the help text part should actually be a required field, even if you just write one sentence. Whatever you write in help text is what you will see here in this help tab. So for example, now I look at the help text of label, but you can also have help text for uh, actual uh, items or regions. So upper level help text. So always a good idea. I know it's a bit annoying, but take some time to, to write help text because it does help out other developers when they're trying to either extend your plugin or understand what it does and, and so on. 
comments box, these are just comments for internal use. Uh, for you as a developer, they don't get shown anywhere. Uh, although I find this a bit restrictive, I would rather uh, write my comments in perhaps a README in some uh, GitHub repository or something like that. But for little things, I guess this is also good enough. So yeah, this page right here is how all plugins get built, probably including the uh, Apex plugins, right? We just don't uh, see them as plugins in our application because they're hidden, but they are there. And this is how they were built. So that was the quick, very quick anatomy of a plugin. So let's talk about the actual code um, that you saw there. Where, what is this even? You might be thinking, and where do I find this, and how do I know the syntax? Well, what most developers do when they create a new plugin, they go right here. There is a little help button, and depending on your type of plugin, you can copy the signature um, of that function that you need uh, to implement. So we copy it, we paste it in here, um, probably format it more often than not, um, and then try to understand what it does, really. Uh, the render function is probably the most, again, commonly used one that must be there. And it looks um, like this. It has a P region and a P plugin. These are the two important parameters. But when does this actually get called? So let's take a step back and think of, um, of the Apex engine. So the Apex engine just pay, um, paints an a big HTML, right, that it then sends off to, to the client. And so it adds, you know, the head and tags and the body tags and based on various settings in those in scripts. But at some point, it will try to interpret your plugin, right, when it gets to it. And what do I do there? What do I really print? That's when it calls your render function. And your render function should then do something, either print HTML out on the screen or register some JavaScript function in case it's a dynamic action, so on and so forth. This is your entry point, your main uh, plugin logic. You can also access through the render function your plugin settings. So for example, under P region, you could say um, P underscore region dot attribute zero one, and that's how you would fetch that setting. But what you see here is the bare minimum of how a render function should look. And in this case, we just print a div onto the page. Um, Ajax functions, they're also um, present in most uh, plugin types. You will need an Ajax function if you want to communicate via Ajax to the server. So you being in the front end, you want to send, to invoke the server, tell it to either do something or to give you some data. This is where you would end up. So you would end up in the Ajax callback where you can do your processing, so on and so forth. And you would usually pass a, um, a JSON uh, object back to the client to know whether whatever action you, you performed was successful or not. So you will need probably very often these render and Ajax functions, and that's what they look like. For dynamic actions, they are slightly different. Um, they follow a pattern. Maybe you can, uh, you can uh, figure it out, but it's still, I've so far not been uh, able to learn them by heart, this, uh, these signatures. I always check the, check the help text or um, have some boilerplate code ready, and I will talk about that in a second. So dynamic actions. We talked a bit about uh, the custom attributes. So the attributes that you will be seeing in the builder, they are the custom attributes from the plugin page. And they can be of different types, right? They can be select lists, plain old text fields, uh, page item references, and so on. Um, again, in terms of files, um, you upload your files in this section and you reference them like we talked about previously. Useful APIs, you will at some point uh, have to use some of these. Hopefully, some of them more often than not, for example, Apex Escape. So an Apex plugin usually consists of two worlds. You have the PL SQL world and you have the JavaScript world. And Apex provides helper functions for both of these places. So in terms of uh, PL SQL, we have all these um, packages in uppercase. 
Apex plugin, a very used one, Apex escape again, very used, Apex JSON, you will uh, need it at some point when developing plugins. Also in terms of JavaScript, if you implement region type plugins or item type plugins, you will have to refer to apex.region and apex.item. So read the documentation because you want your plugin to be well and tightly integrated with the rest of Apex. So if you have a region that's refreshable, you want the refresh dynamic action to actually refresh your region as well. And you can only do that by um, implementing an interface via apex.region. Same for an item. If you want to have the functionality of get value, set value, either in JavaScript or via the dynamic actions, you have to implement it via apex.item. Keep that in mind. Also, apex.server, a great namespace that one helps you with uh, server-side communication. So Ajax um, communication happens via apex.server.plugin. So here you have a list of the most widely used uh, APIs. Security is not really any different than the rest of Apex. There's two big attack vectors that we might, uh, that we have to consider, and they apply for plugins as well. SQL injection and cross-site scripting. Um, so always as a rule of thumb, never do any query or script concatenation. Use bind variables everywhere, um, but I won't get into that now. Uh, Cross-site scripting. I could give you an example right here. So say you're printing out something to the, to the client um, and you're concatenating some values, right? Because you don't, you don't want that div to be empty, you want to put some content in there. Depending on, the, where, on where L content comes from, it might or might not be a safe value to use. So for example, if it comes from some uh, table row um, in your database that may be an end user populated, that is not safe. Um, data, so that must be skipped because they could a a, a a bad actor could inject some script tags to do some nasty things in there. So uh, for um, for HTML attributes, always HTML attribute is the function to use, and for the actual uh, content, dot uh, HTML is part of the Apex Escape package. Even if you're sure that you're um, what you're inputting there is safe. Um, it's always good and best practice to just escape everything. Always escape unless you know L content contains HTML, in which case you would uh, you would uh, break that. But as a rule of thumb, always escape beyond the safe side. Okay, um, make your life easier. So as we saw here. Um, it takes, it takes a little bit of time to always write this code, to always figure out how to access the attributes. I still forget whether attributes are in P plugin or P region, so every time I have to try both. So why not have some uh, boilerplate code, right, ready for when you create your next plugin? For example, I created for this demo a boilerplate region plugin which I encourage you to do the same. If you are going to get into plugin development, just have six boilerplate plugins, right, for each individual um, item, uh, uh, plugin type. For example, this one is for the region. So it includes already this, uh, this code that we need. Um, it also already tries to read some attributes. Even if they're not there, it will be null, that's fine. Um, it also takes care of uh, debug and outputs a div onto the, the page, which is usually uh, the, mi the minimum that you would have to do in a region type plugin. So I really suggest you invest a little bit of time and create your own boilerplate uh, plugins. That way you can also um, use your own coding standards and so on and really um, standardize the plugin, plugins inside of your organization. And then when you create a new one, you just go on create and as a copy of an already existing plugin, which we'll do in a second. So um, at some point when creating plugins, you will get stuck and the answers are not always uh, um, so obvious. And I found that better than raising a, um, some issue on a forum or asking on Twitter, it's, I always found the answer when looking at other people's plugins. So it actually is encouraged 
to just uh, go under plugins, find one that's similar to yours or at least the same, uh, I, the same plugin type, go to GitHub um, and see how that one was built. Usually you will, your questions will be answered by just doing that. And it's also a great uh, learning opportunity to see how other things are done. A uh, little thing, check the return to page <laughs> um, checkbox. So let's say we're developing this plugin. Always click this so that when you click apply changes, you will be returned to this page and not to this page. Such a tiny thing, but it, I think over the years it would save you hours. Um, yes, so two things that are kind of difficult with um, plugins is perhaps if you do not necessarily love the PL SQL editor here, this environment, you can use an IDE, like SQL developer, to develop your code in. But then your code would probably go in a package, right? So then you would have to say my package dot render function, and this would stay empty, but all of your code would reside in a package. You can do that as well, um, in case you prefer an actual IDE. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that does require a database connection if you want to use SQL Developer, right? So you will not be able to do this on apex.oracle.com, for example. My biggest problem, however, with, and probably most plugin developers out there, is the editing of JavaScript and CSS files. Because unless you have some self-made build tool that uh, uploads the files for you, um, the only way really out of the box to update our files is to perhaps edit them locally and upload a new, a new version. That is, um, that is a bit painful. So the open source community, some great guys came together and built uh, Apex Nitro that helps you with that. So you can develop your files locally and with the click of a button um, or with one command in the command line, you can push your changes that go through the database. So Apex Nitro, if you haven't heard of it, I encourage you to go uh, look it up. It is a great tool. However, it again requires a database connection because it works through SQL CL. So this will not work for you on apex.oracle.com. But if you remember from the beginning, I have a quick announcement now that we're done with the theory. And it has to do with that last thing I mentioned. So, um, this came out of a need to edit those static files because I found myself not even starting on ideas for plugins that I had simply because it was a bit too cumbersome. So that's why I did one uh, build those uh, boilerplate plugins for myself so that I can get started much faster. And two, I had to figure out a way to deal with static files in Apex. And this does not only apply to uh, plugins, right? It's static files in general. So. If we go on the static files list, what you might notice, first of all, is this little extension, right? So I have a little extension. As you can see, it is called the Apex Builder extension by FOSS, FOSS being FOEX open source. So maybe you see where I'm going with this. It is a browser extension that allows you to edit static files directly in your builder. So we have a couple of files right here. And see the extension injected this little region up here so that when we go and pick a file that, um, that we actually parsed from this report right here, we can actually go ahead and open it in an actual editor, right? Um, we can edit it. It has a great editor behind it, the same one as behind the uh, Visual Studio Code. So you get auto completion and uh, a bunch of other features. And we can save our file. We can just click the Save button, and it will be saved. That's it. No Apex Nitro required, no other tools. It just works. Do you want to edit two files at the same time? Simply open another file, and you can sw uh, switch between the tabs. Same thing, save. JavaScript files can also be minified. There's also less file combination and a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of new features. Do you want to go really hardcore with your development, make it full screen, and have your editors side by side? So the way I like to develop plugins nowadays is using this feature to have my JavaScript code on the left, my CSS on the right, and even with Control-S, 
you will save your files. That's about it. That's the big announcement um, concerning this uh, browser extension. So it can edit application, workspace, and plugin files directly in the builder with no other dependencies. You don't need a database connection. It will be free and open source very, very soon. Uh, we are working on a Chrome and Firefox version so that we can satisfy everyone's needs. Um, so far, it's been tested on uh, 5.1 and upwards. All is good. Oh, by the way, just quickly, just to quickly show off, light mode works as well if you're um, more into that look and feel. Um, again, it will be out soon. So if you follow either me or Folks plugins on Twitter, we will be announcing it maybe next week if we're, if we're lucky. So really excited about this. I think it will help a lot of developers out there uh, with their regular application files, but also with plugin development because you will have everything on one page that you need to get um, up and running. So we, set, we talked about some theory, my little announcement, and let's quickly do a live demo. And if I'm, if I'm correct, I still have 10 minutes. Live demo will consist of building a plugin from start to finish. In 10 minutes, that's a bit uh, optimistic, but I'll do my best. So, as most developers, um, I like to browse GitHub sometimes. And sometimes I find really cool things. And I'm thinking, hmm, this might actually be cool inside of Apex. It would be cool if we got that going. So let's say I'm browsing around, and I see this little um, repository with a little library that adds. Interesting. So there are some text fields, and we see a preview, a live preview of a credit card as the user types in their information. It's completely unnecessary, but it gives you a little bit of uh, eye candy or the end user. So how do we build this into a plugin? Um, well, there, first we have to decide what type of plugin it is. Does it hold a session state value? Not really, it's just a visual thing. Um, is it a dynamic action? Not really. I would more consider it a region because it is a big visual thing on the page and maybe we could hook into it some actual page items. So I, I went ahead and I, uh, I built this page here. This would be my form for a credit card, but then again, it's kind of boring. So it would be nice to have the preview up top and perhaps hook already into these uh, page items. So as settings for the plugin, we could perhaps uh, tell it, hey, pick the number from P1 number, pick the name from P1 name, and so on. So I went ahead and I downloaded this repository. I read a bit about how it works, and it turns out it will be a region type plugin. Um, it will have four item type attributes, so four settings, where we mention which uh, item um, belongs to which field. Um, oh, and yes, because it's a library, as all things, there are some files that we must include, right? So there's some files in this dist um, directory, which we'll have to include in our, uh, in our plugin. In terms of, no, let's first do this and then continue with the rest. So we want to create a new plugin, eight minutes as a copy of an already existing plugin. And we're gonna use our boilerplate plugin, so we don't really start from zero. So we say, yes, I want to copy this one. This is the already finished one. I just have it there just in case. Um, and let's give it a name. Let's call it credit card preview. We say copy plugins. And we see it appear here, credit card preview on our page, so this is page one, I have uh, a couple of fields. If we refresh this page now, we will already see an instance of our plugin. So that being a region, we can see it under regions. So credit card preview plugin, it already appeared here. It doesn't really do anything, so when we run it, it's just a blank region. 
and the header and everything comes from the template of the region, which is standard. So I, like, I would like to do two things. I want to center where that plugin is going to go, and I would like to put the styling of that region away. So right now it will look like it has disappeared, but it is there, right? We just haven't outputted anything to the screen. So that's number one. The plugin exists and is in use. And because I instantiated it before changing the internal name, good to, good to know, we cannot change the internal name anymore. For demo reasons, consider it um, um, planned. Um, right, so we have our little code here that doesn't really do anything, just some uh, debug and the basic uh, development. Um, and we said earlier, we want to upload the files, right? So I already went ahead and downloaded that uh, library. I went in the disk folder and they said, you can either use the jQuery version or the non jQuery, but being that we already have jQuery on the page, uh, because it's built into Apex, we can just use that and also take the CSS. So we upload our files to our plugin. But then they must be referenced because right now we're not really doing anything with them. So JavaScript, I always forget the syntax. Okay, so it's plugin files. And then we just add the name. Uh, same for the CSS that we take this right here. Go back here. As always, return to page and save the changes. OK, still nothing is happening, though, probably. Um, what else do we have here? It's a region. It includes the library files. Let's add the settings for it. So to add settings for a plugin, we would go under custom attributes. And this will be a bit of a repetitive task. So just stick with me. We, have, we want to offer the four settings so that we can hook into existing page items with. So let's call this number item. And it will be of type page item, and it will be required. Then we have name item. It will be of page item, and it will be required. Then we will have the expiry item. It will be a page item and required. And the last one, the so-called CVC number item. item. Create. So they already exist, as we can see. They are right here. And if we were to refresh the page, we will see that our plugin here has already some attributes. So the attributes that we created now appear as settings in the builder. So let's just quickly populate them. So we want to hook up the number item to the um, P1 number, P1 name, P1 expiry, P1 CVC. We still don't read or do anything with these items yet, but at least we have our settings. Okay. I also went ahead and I read the documentation of this um, library. And I sort of figured out how to use it. Turns out it's not that difficult. You just need a div on the page with some unique ID, and then this piece of JavaScript code. Here you would um, reference the unique ID of your div, where the thing will be rendered, and the IDs of the page items, which we can take from the settings. And because I'm running out of time, I will just cheat a little bit. But I will go through the code real quick because it's really not that complicated. Nope. Let's just paste this in. Everything looks good. Return, apply changes. So what I've done here is, 
First of all, we can use this P region to actually read the attributes from that certain uh, specific instance. And we give them a name. For example, L number item will actually have the value of that setting that the developer uh, set. Um, so just like in the boilerplate code, we output one empty div. And this is where the magic happens. So this little bit, bit of uh, what ends up to be a JavaScript call on the page will basically output this as per the um, documentation. So what we do is we don't really want to work and concatenate this string uh, or this uh, JavaScript call uh, manually, right? And that's why we can use Apex JSON package, which is awesome. So you can really properly build objects and so on. The only bit of concatenation is this right here. Um, and then we fetch that uh, big main object. That's a parameter. And that we can concatenate. But that is fine because it is a clean output that Apex JSON get CLOB output uh, um, returns us. So if all is well, I did what it says here. I will now run my page. Hey, it seems to have worked. So now if I type in four two, oh, that's a visa. If I type in five two two, that's a MasterCard. Um, I type in your name, expiry, and some number. So you see, it's a really cool uh, little plugin. It, that's it. It works. Um, it also has the side effect of, uh, of uh, applying some, uh, some client-side validation or restrictions on those item fields. So I cannot type in further here. And uh, this is, for example, restricted to, to three numbers. Um, very interesting side effect. That's it. Our plugin is now done. We would go and export it, send it off to whoever, perhaps even uh, upload it to GitHub and post it on apex.world. That's been it for me. Thanks, guys. Are there questions? And where do I see those questions? Yeah, I've got uh, uh, a list of questions for you. So first of all, a great presentation. And uh, <clears throat> I see the Apex Builder extension is a great addition. And there was a question about the uh, builder extension as well. So does it need a database connection or is it plug and play and you're done? It's plug and play and you're done. No database connection needed. Right, cool. Can I quickly, sh can I quickly, ah, uh, let me see if that's possible. Uh, can I quickly give away how it works? Just sure. in 10 seconds. Um, let's go to share components. In short, the magic is basically how do we, there's two problems, fetching the file and saving the file. We already have this download button right here, right? So we fetch it by JavaScript, we fetch the contents, we call that uh, link, and then we just display it in a code editor. And the way we save the file is basically we hiddenly, away from the user's uh, eyes, open this uh, model in the background, and upload the file as a blob. It gets overwritten, and uh, that's it. It works uh, beautifully. It's a tiny hack, but it works and it makes a big difference when developing pretty much anything. Yeah, very smart. <laughs> um, another thing, uh, people are interested in your boilerplate region template or plugin. Is that something you can share? Yes, so I would actually encourage people to go check out uh, Daniel's GitHub. Just type in Daniel Hochleitner now GitHub boilerplate. He has boilerplate for everything. Um, but I could also look into sharing my own uh, um, code, but I don't have it ready right now to do so. Okay, that's cool. And some general questions about plugins. So people notice then when they upgrade Apex that a plugin might break. Um, do you have some advice? when that happens? Uh, yes, I would assume that the first thing you should do is contact the developer. If it's a open source plugin, um, if you're lucky, the developer will get back to you and say, hey, I fixed it. Because it's usually not a big thing that breaks from what I've seen. It's, uh, these are small little uh, API changes or, or something. So if the developer is uh, nice and friendly, he will fix it for you. If not, you're out of luck and you will have to fix it yourself. 
uh, unfortunately. Or you go the commercial route and, um, you know, you paid money for that uh, plugin, so it will, it is guaranteed it will work on the next version. That's just the, what we have to live with. Another question is, um, if somehow your organization doesn't want you to use external plugins, is there a way in Apex that you can disable the option to create or to use or install plugins from the builder? Not that I know of, no. And I mean, the developers should be uh, responsible enough if they are told no, not to use any, right? Right, right. right. And no, no setting that I know of to disable that. Um, you talked a little bit about the metadata function that is a callback function in the plugin. Um, do you have an example of a use case for that metadata callback? Um, I uh, don't recall having talked about it, but, uh, and I also don't have an example, but it is used as far as I know for some uh, interactive grid. If you have an item, uh, for example, that uh, works in a cell in an interactive grid, you kind of have to share the information with the grid that it, for example, uh, in, it can have multiple values or stuff like that. So in such edge cases, you will need to um, you will need to use it. But in most plugins, I have not seen it being it's more for advanced plugins. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, if you write PL SQL code, right, for your plugin, and you write this in a package, is there any way that you can uh, attach this package uh, in the plugin itself? Uh, not um, via the conventional export button, but you can make your own export script if you know what you're doing. It takes a bit of manual work. Perhaps you can even automate it. Uh, yes, it is possible, uh, but just not out of the box. Okay. And do you know of a plugin that refreshes an item? Um, a plugin that fetches the newest value from session state? I think so, yeah. Um, well, you would just have an, uh, an empty execute uh, PL SQL code dynamic action with a return item. That's how everyone does it, I suppose. Yes. Um, let me see if I... So how do you decide when something should be a plugin or not? People tend to think, yeah, what should be the first plugin? I, I want to develop something, but what is a good use case for, for a plugin? If you want a, um, a bit of functionality that you want to share with others, better than putting it in a blog, blog post and explaining all the steps you took to build it, just build a plugin and share the SQL file. Or again, as mentioned, if you have a functionality on more pages that is sort of similar, you could consider uh, packing it up in a plugin. Yeah. And the last question that came in, uh, can I build a plugin that uses an Apex component like a classic report or something like that? Um, I'm sure there are ways to hack yourself around that. Maybe to use some of their markup or... Uh, or even perhaps call some internal functions if you're brave enough. Uh, but it is not um, recommended to do such things, really. Yeah, understandable. Okay, thank you very much. 